In June 1840, a British expeditionary force of 16 warships with 4,000 marines left India to seek retribution for the destruction of the opium. The Chinese blockaded the entrance to the port of Guangzhou with chains. The British Armada simply bypassed Guangzhou and occupied three other key ports, Hong Kong, Nianguo, and Tianjin. In response, the Chinese called for a meeting in Guangzhou, agreed to cede Hong Kong to the British indefinitely and agreed to pay a large compensation for the destroyed opium. The British Crown didn't think this was enough, so in 1841 sent another, even larger expeditionary force of 10,000 men. Several strategic ports were occupied, including Shanghai and Nanjing. Faced with defeat, hundreds of Qing officers committed suicide. The British, having already undergone the Industrial Revolution, possessed much better weaponry, the capacity to support an expeditionary force of this sort. And they were able to land first in southern China and then to advance and threaten the capital. It took three years, but the British were able to compel the Chinese government to capitulate. Um, the decisive moments in the Opium War basically have to do with steamships. That the British are able to do something that the Qing never expected anyone could do, which is to sail upriver and get behind coastal forts that had all their guns pointed out that way. Um, once they could do that, they could threaten the Yangtze River and the Grand Canal. The Grand Canal is, as they called it, the throat of Beijing. It's the thing on which you ship southern rice up to the northern capital. Once the British can threaten that, the Chinese want to settle fast, and that's what they do. And in 1842, the Treaty of Nanjing was signed. And this treaty provided for First, the Chinese had to pay for the cost of the war, the cost incurred by the British. Second, it ceded the territory of Hong Kong to Britain in perpetuity. And third, it allowed for the opening of five coastal uh, zones to British traders. The most famous of these is, of course, Shanghai. It changed the relationship between the West and China in a really striking way. Quickly after that, the French were able to sign a treaty with the, with the Chinese that allowed for missionaries to enter China. And in 1845, the United States signed a treaty with China, getting all of the benefits that the British and French had already won as well as introducing a new idea, the idea of most favored nation status, which meant that whatever deals the Chinese would offer other foreign countries in subsequent agreements, the Americans would receive automatically as well. The Qing Dynasty like all the Chinese dynasties, was really a continental power. A few Europeans arrive by sea, defeat your very weak navy, take a few ports and open up for trade. Would you see that as a threat to your whole system? They didn't. So a wake-up call it should have been, but it was not understood in that way because they didn't see this as a long-term threat. It was only after the Second Opium War in the 1860 that then they realized something was fundamentally wrong. These people are not just invading for a short while and causing some trouble on the coast and then going away. They are actually pressing inwards and they actually march into Beijing and they burn down the Summer Palace and that was serious. <laughs> Do you want to use English or do you want to use English? Yes, I can.
，随便说说，没关系。啊，您中文讲得很棒哈。没有没有，太客气。啊，你们是哪个国家的？呃，是美国人。是美国的。啊，你们怎么看待圆明园这块？那当然是觉得遗憾，因为这个也毕竟是是西方国家，也是破坏这个地方，所以这个也是很难很难受。我们不仅遗憾，而且非常的愤怒。嗯、看完之后非常愤怒，心里有有一种无名的怒火。我当时也挺，想想当时为什么你们要侵略我们？难道就因为我们比较过？不是，我是说啊，我是说有八国联军或者是英法联军，但不是美国，美国还是比较好，一个非常好的一个国度。但是美国也也八国联军也也有。八国联军有美国啊，但是不是主导。相信你们肯定当时你当时我相信，如果你在的话，能阻止一切。<笑>确实就是这个意思。这是你你如果是没毁的话，我们现在看应该是金碧辉煌，非常好看的。对，跟在明朝代留下很多这些好的这些、就是、这些什么这个遗产，快烂石头就是。嗯、呃，就是说，其实别管各地的各地的文明，它是属于一个世界的遗产。当时因为一种狭隘的民族主义，使得一个世界的遗产。化为灰烬了，所以现在就留给是一个世界的遗憾，不光是中国人的遗憾，这样子。嗯嗯。所以说不要再有战争。嗯、no war 嗯。嗯。嗯，好的，一起。嗯，说的非常好，谢谢啊，谢谢你们，谢谢。In 1856, off the coast of Guangdong, the Chinese Coast Guard seized a British merchant ship suspected of carrying contraband. Soon afterwards, the British and French joined forces and renewed the war against China. They demanded that the opium trade be legalized throughout China, that the Chinese Customs Office be put under their control, that tariffs on goods made in Europe be limited and that all Western missionaries be allowed to operate without hindrance. Frustrated with these demands, officials of the Qing dynasty arrested the Anglo-French delegation in Beijing. A few days later, 20 members of this delegation were tortured and executed by the Emperor's so-called Board of Punishments. The British and French forces encountered little resistance, and after easily destroying the Tarpon forts on the High River, they stormed Beijing. The Qing government surrendered unconditionally and agreed with all the demands. However, Lord Elgin, the British High Commissioner to China, decided to strongly discourage the Chinese from ever executing diplomatic envoys again. 3,500 English and French troops with heavy artillery were ordered to surround the Summer Palace. In the early 18th century, the Chinese emperor invested better than a dozen years and huge, huge amounts of labor and money in erecting Yuan Mingyuan. This became the chief playground for the imperial family. One portion of this was designed by a foreign missionary to look like Versailles. In the middle of the 19th century, a combination of British and French forces took about a day and a half to destroy what had taken better than a dozen years, and huge amounts of labor and treasure to build. Laid waste to Yuan Mingyuan, looted it, and destroyed it, leaving a scar on the land and a scar in the Chinese psyche. After the devastating defeats and the humiliating setbacks, the emperors realized that we were weak, but, we, but they did not realize that we were corrupt because we didn't have a strong parliament. We didn't have uh, uh, the noble Hish, whose uh, strong interest in protection of their vested interests would um, 
uh, urge them to take part in parliamentary elections and to elect those they, those they trust and to uh, formulate a mechanism of check and balance. Uh, so I think the Western democracy is very much motivated by the idea of protecting private ownership. Uh, we don't have the private ownership. I think the last 200 years of Chinese history has to do with the rise of the West. Unfortunately, all the Western powers went to China for economic purposes, and none of them ever tried to reform her political system. And that is for good reason. It is easier to make quick profits in a country without the rule of law. I think the same is true today. Corporations go to China knowing that if you bribe officials, you can make anything happen. We were latecomers to democracy. I think latecomers always need international support in order to reform their system. We didn't get it. Starting in 1861, the British and French sign a treaty with the Qing Dynasty in which they get pretty much everything they want. And then they realize something, which is, wait a minute. We now have everything we want from these people. What if the dynasty fell? What a nuisance. We'd have to start all over again. We don't want to do that. It was much more practical for them to instead enter into what was called the cooperative policy, which was a policy of, let's try and keep the Qing on the throne, push them, make them implement the treaties, but not push them so hard that we topple them. The wake up call was indeed the Opium War. A group of scholars um, started to reflect upon whether we should uh, go to the West and fortunately, uh, those rulers who were defeated were able to pay the, the tuition fees for the first group of uh, young Chinese uh, students who were sent to the States to study advanced technologies. The coming of the West really accelerated the downfall of the Manchu dynasty. They were already having problems with peasant unrest beginning in the late 18th century, peasant rebellions. I mean huge ones, not small ones, millions and millions of people. And in that situation, the Chinese state was losing, the Manchu dynasty was losing sovereignty. The West was taking territory and taking concessions. Uh, the, the West was determining the terms of trade, uh, deciding how much tariff the Chinese could charge on the importation of goods, and Western machine-made goods were beginning to drive Chinese handmade goods out of existence. Um, and so you had a real deflation of imperial power, and their decision to send students abroad to learn how to make ships and, and cannons and railroads came too little too late. The Qing Dynasty became worried, but even then, they were worried, yes, they must learn from the West and fight back and defend the country, but they didn't think it was a threat to their civilization, to the cultural uh, underpinnings of, the, of that civilization. The political system seemed to be very stable. They had major rebellions within the country, and they beat them back one after the other. The Taiping rebels, the Muslim rebels, the 
they were having trouble with these Europeans coming by sea, but it did not really occur to them that this is ultimately something that would destroy the whole system. Why did they not wake up? Because they were so confident of their system. It's been there around for 2,000 years. Dealt with all our enemies, one way or the other. We will deal with this one as well. Until it was too late. And they only really, finally, woke up when they were defeated by the Japanese. That was incredible. A small country which they had despised and thought was not a problem. To, be, to actually lose to Japan. And why did the Japanese beat them? Because they actually learned from the West. American objectives change as America's position in the world changes. All right, so in the mid 19th century, we're a relatively weak power. And basically what we're doing for most of the 19th century is we're piggybacking on the British, which suits American interests as well because we're a strong commercial power and a weak military one at that point. And so we want the same things as other Westerners. Right? We want to be able to trade. We want to be able to send in missionaries. If Britain opened China to trade, the United States proceeded to do the same thing for Japan. In 1852, Commodore Matthew Perry, leading four American battleships, sailed into Tokyo Bay. The fiercely isolationist Japanese were given an ultimatum open up trade, or trade will be opened by the cannon barrel. Fearing the Chinese fate of humiliation and defeat, the Japanese leadership embarked on the most radical reform since their recorded history. When China and Japan uh, encountered the West in the beginning in the early 19th century, their responses were entirely different because their societies had become different. The, the centralized empire of China was still intact with its Confucian orthodoxy, uh, which still wanted to control everything that came in and went out. Whereas in Japan, you had had the disintegration um, of empire and a series of feudal states, more like Europe where the samurai were, became sort of these wandering merchants and entrepreneurs. Um, so that when the West came knocking on the Japanese door, they saw that there were things the Westerners had that they could use to make themselves more powerful, perhaps against their regional rivals within Japan. Um, and so they were able to adapt, whereas the Chinese, this old and rigid, ossified empire when it was challenged by the coming of the West, rejected. The Meiji Restoration resulted in the first Japanese constitution, handed down by the emperor as a badge of civilization and enlightenment. While still ambiguous and at times self-contradictory, the first constitution guaranteed the individual the right to his property, the freedom of speech, assembly and association. The shogunate was dissolved as a governing institution. Political parties and a free press were established. Trade with the West flourished. By the end of the century, over a thousand miles of railroad was built and Japan became the third largest steel producer in the world. The Japanese learned the Chinese language they read the classics, they borrowed a lot of ideas from the Chinese initially, thousands odd years ago. But in fact, they were very independent of China. They never were subjugated by the Chinese. They never even paid tribute to the Chinese. They admired the Chinese a great deal. But their admiration for China was challenged when they found the Chinese defeated by the Europeans. And since they never really cared that much for China, they just from what they learned from China, the admiration for China was for China's success and prosperity. Once they saw the West defeat the Chinese, they, be, they paid attention. They say, if the West can beat them, and those West just are some ships, and their countries way, way far away, can come all that way and defeat the Chinese, there's something wrong with China. So we stop looking to China, stop admiring the Chinese, Look at how these Westerners did it. If the Westerners can do it from that far away, we are so near, we can do it too.
one aspect of the newly found Bunmei Keika was the contempt for other Asian nations. Korea, at times called by the Japanese press a dagger pointed at the heart of Japan, became an obvious target. Rich in iron ore and coal, Korea has been part of the Chinese Empire since the 16th century. In 1894, the Chinese Secret Service assassinated Kim ok yun a Korean revolutionary with Japanese sympathies. Soon after, war erupted as both sides rushed to increase their troop numbers in the peninsula. The Chinese could only deploy 4,000 troops led by General Wan Shikai. They were no match for the better led and better armed Japanese army. The lethal problem that killed the last Food Dynasty was the corruption. Uh, Director Cixi embezzled the funds for the Chinese Navy for the construction of a royal garden, uh, the Summer Palace. And she knew very well that we're going to have a, a, a war with the Japanese. Everybody at different levels, either in the Navy, in the Army, or in the government, was only loyal to his or her own vested interests instead of the future of the nation. At sea, the Chinese Navy found itself vastly outgunned. While Japan bought three new battleships from England during the 1870s, the Empress Dowager took the Chinese naval budget to build a new summer palace. In a matter of hours, the Chinese Navy was annihilated. Hundreds of Qing seamen found their death in the frigid waters as the Japanese Navy took no prisoners. Korean Empress Myung Seong was murdered by Japanese troops for siding with China. In a matter of years, the entire Korean Peninsula and Taiwan became the first Japanese colonies. This marked a new era for the Chinese state. From losing trade concessions and a few ports, now entire territories were torn apart in the country. The last Chinese dynasty had collapsed by 1911, resulting in further disintegration and decay. Their natures are dark dangerous and inscrutable. Wherever they go, they spy around with view to seizing other people's lands. Of all the island barbarians under heaven, the redhead barbarians, the island barbarians, and the Japanese are the three most deadly. There's nothing in Chinese history anyway to suggest that they would expand territorially. There's nothing again in Chinese history that they would attack anybody. They have fought, but mainly on their own frontiers. They've fought many, many times for reasons which may or may not be justified, but they have fought along their frontiers, but they've never gone beyond what was traditionally Chinese frontiers. Would they now do otherwise? I have no reason to believe that they would be so foolish as to do that. The world is different. There's no room for empires. Nobody's going to accept it. The world will not accept it, and they know it. They don't believe in regime change elsewhere. They don't believe in intervening in other people's affairs. I think they genuinely believe that because they are very concerned that other people should not intervene in their own affairs, and they want to keep the principle of state sovereignty is absolute. Now, I think it is the fault of the Chinese rulers. They brought upon our people pain and misery. Our governments, to the present day, never accepted a system that would limit their powers in order to benefit society. The treaties that the West imposed on us also benefited the ruling class. The victims were always the Chinese people.
As the government always controlled the education, it was easy to create this blaming of the West for all of China's problems. That's where this national feeling of shame and humiliation is coming from. We want to, we love peace. You got to remember the Chinese are hopelessly peace loving. We don't want to invade, we don't want to bully. We just want everybody to be happy the way we hope you expect us to be happy. But the way Chinese have been treated previously uh, was not very nice. It means we cannot forget history. That will serve as the impetus and the incentive for us to move forward, to construct the Chinese economy, to resume our dignity with the re-emergence of this big power. And then we want to be treated as equals, not only in the United Nations Security Council or IMF, but in almost all of the major world bodies. And I think China is welcome, because a dialogue instead of a confrontation is a way out for having a bright future.